Well, Psalm 145 is one of the uh, unique psalms of David. Again, I know I'm about wore that out, that, but it truly is. It's one of my very favorites. If I had to pick my favorite psalms, I would be very hard pressed to do it, but I would pick probably Psalm 45, probably Psalm 110, and Psalm 145. And then I had to maybe squeeze Psalm 2 in there. But I don't know, but Psalm 145 would be the very top of the list because what happens in this psalm is, is that David, it's, the, it's actually the last psalm in the book of Psalms is it, in, in one of its uh, forms. I mean, the book of Psalms grew over the years. The last five psalms make a set together, and it, they form, they're like an appendix. They're all the praise the Lord psalms. And they're not written by David. This is the last of the book as it was uh, uh, known at one time. And then these other psalms were written as a holy appendix or a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a thing at the very end of just saying, Lord, we love you, we worship you. A doxology, that's what I'm trying to say. A doxology is what the last uh, five psalms go together as a set. And so this actually at one time ended the book of Psalms. It's the last psalm of David. I think they put it here strategically as the last psalm, as the, as the uh, pinnacle of the book of Psalms. It's David giving a model. He's laying out in the clearest way the model of what he understands that makes him a worshiper of God. And if you are serious about David's understanding of the beauty of the Lord that made David a worshiper, Psalm 145 is, one of the, is, is a must psalm. Because it is the psalm of the beauty of the Lord that David lays out. There's no psalm that's like it. Matter of fact, in the title, it's called A Psalm of David. And it's the only psalm that actually in its title that has gone through the Hebrew Scriptures that is called the Psalm of David. I mean, there are many of them that, that later on, the, those that put together and canonized the Scripture, they would write something above it. But David wrote this himself. This is part of the original part of the psalm. There's two psalms where David calls it, David himself calls it the prayer of David, Psalm 17 and Psalm 86. Two times David wrote that. And one psalm of all the psalms that David wrote, one time he puts the psalm of David. This is the... The, uh, the praise of David, the psalm of David. This is David's praise. David's special psalm, psalm or song of praise is what really a psalm is. It's the only one that David titled himself as the praise or the psalm that, that David sang before the Lord. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher in the 1850s in, in London, called this David's favorite psalm because of the title, A Praise of David or A Psalm of David. It's his, it's his very own. It's the one that he ascribed as his own. It's the one that he said, when they're all said and done, this is the one that I like the best. It's his model of worship. Chapter Psalm 144, verse 9, David cries out, I will sing a new psalm. And it's been a tradition that Psalm 145 is the new song that David sang. That's a, kind of been a popular tradition for, for many, many years and through church history. That The new song is actually Psalm 145. It's a psalm that's based, or it's praise, that's based on David's revelation of God's unsearchable greatness. He makes it very clear. Again, this psalm forms the pinnacle, the end of the whole book of Psalms before the doxology of the last five psalms are laid there. Or, or, or uh, laid out there. Psalm 145, verse 1 and 2. He starts off in a personal note. I will extol you, my God, my King. Here's the King of Israel at the end of his life calling God the King. He acknowledges the royalty belongs to God. And again, the, the significant word here is the word my. This is based in his own personal experience. Matter of fact, Praise, true praise and worship is not something that we just do in a meeting, but it's the overflow of what takes place in the secret place of our heart. It has to be, it has to be my God or praise isn't praise. The one that David, you know, throughout the 
book of Psalms. He's the God of the stars and the sun and the moon, the God of history, the God of redemption. But here He's my God. He's the God that I know deep in the secret place of my heart. This is the power of David's life. It was intensely personal to him. It was real. It wasn't just academic. It wasn't something he did because everybody gathered on Sunday morning. It was something that permeated his life outside of public gatherings. Now, a lot of us like to, to claim that. We, we, we want to claim that we praise the Lord outside of public gatherings. But it doesn't happen that often in the life of the average believer. I mean, maybe for a moment they say, I praise you. But there was a fragrance, there was an incense that arose out of David's spirit. He was a worshiper of God as a lifestyle. It wasn't something he did when the saints gathered alone. It was in his spirit throughout the day. I don't mean he never ever took a break from it, but he lived to be a worshiper first and to be king second. I remember I went on a retreat uh, once. A high, it was a college retreat. I think I was 19 years old. And, and the leader of the retreat said, I want everybody to write down their life vision. Put it down on paper. The one thing that you will submit everything in your life to. So, you know, it's like, wow, I never thought of putting that in, into words. He says, I'm not talking about your occupation, what you want to be in your occupation. He says, I'm not even talking about what you want to do in your ministry. I'm talking about the one thing you will submit your occupation and your ministry to. I thought, well, that's an interesting question. And, they were, and this little weekend retreat was about establishing our life vision. David had a life vision. He had something bigger than being king, something bigger than defeating his enemies. And I wrote down my life vision. I wrote, I want to be an extravagant worshiper of God and an anointed deliverer of people. I want to be a worshiper and a deliverer. I didn't actually know, know I fell right into the two great commandments, love God and love people. But I wrote that down and I began to really build my life around it. At that point in time, I was uh, planning to go to medical school. I'd had an, an opportunity to go to med school, had an acceptance to a med school. And at that time, I was thinking about, I mean, at that point in time, I was going to do that. And so I wasn't thinking of being a preacher. I was going to be a doctor and my idea was to go to the mission field and do whatever the latest biography I read, whatever that guy did. At that point in time, it was J. Hudson Taylor. He went to China, so I was going to go to China, you know. And, of course, then uh, I'd read another one, and then I'd go to Africa. You know, I didn't care where I went. I just wanted to go and die. You know, that's what the, the big deal was. Be a missionary and go and get martyred. You know, that's all the books that our youth group was reading. And so, so it wasn't my occupation, because I actually had a different idea of what my occupation... I had no thought of, quote, being in the professional ministry. That wasn't on my mind at all. And I wrote, I want to be an extravagant worshiper of God. And I want to be an anointed and equipped deliverer of people. I want to worship and then bring other people into worship. And just through the years, I've just stuck with it. And it, it ended, up, uh, ended up, it was a God-inspired, it was a blessed life vision. But a life vision is something for which your ministry vision and your occupation vision is, sub is, is uh, submitted to. It's something that you do bigger than your ministry or bigger than your occupation. A lot of folks don't have a life vision. A lot of folks have a an unspoken one they've never really put into words in a real graphic way but it's basically to be happy on earth they just never really they've never really thought it through thoroughly but they want things that make their life happy on earth say what do you want I want to be and they're thinking automatically towards things that make them happy in this life say I want to make enough money to make so I can take pain away and have enough people like me okay let me see let me think how all that could work but there's something bigger than that. And David was a worshiper before he was king. It's nice to say, but that is the power of David's life. A lot of people confess that it's not my job to figure out who's saying it, true or false. That's none of my business. I have no real even curiosity about that, to be honest. But I'm saying that it's more than getting the book, buying the tape, and going to the seminar and talking about how good the tape and the book and the seminar were. It's not about claiming. It's not about academic exercises. It's about a fragrance that emanates out of our spirit 
a vision that's gripped us to touch the heart of God that's bigger than any prominence or any promise of ministry or anointing or authority that we'll ever have on the earth. And I want to challenge you to enter into what David, I believe, this defines as, I will bless the Lord. He says, I will be a man on the earth and I will be a man of the eternal city. I will consume my being in magnifying, worshiping, blessing the name of God. I will give myself to God. David said, I will four times in these two verses. He says, I will extol, I will bless, I will praise, I will magnify. And there's, there's nuances, there's subtleties between those words that I don't have that much interest in the subtleties. I just want to go for it. And although I believe that there's merit in defining this, you know, separating some of the, the distinguishing between some of the subtleties, etc. So I will bless your name forever and forever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name. David was preoccupied theologically with the idea of the name of God. The name of God being the personality of God, being the beauty of God. David knew that fresh discoveries of the beauty of God would make him a worshiper. When the fuel runs low on revelation of God, your energy for worship runs low. That's a fact. And I believe that David understood that simple theological reality. I'll say that again. When the fuel of revelation of the beauty of God runs low in our life, of which in the church today, in the Western world, even worldwide, the revelation of the beauty of the Lord is low. That's why a heart gripped as a worshiper outside of meetings runs low. And David knew that it was the name of the Lord, the unfolding of what God was like to the human spirit that would cause him to fulfill his life vision. I will praise, I will extol, I will bless you. I believe that was David's life vision, to be a worshiper of God. I believe that was the highest desire David had, to be an abandoned, extravagant worshiper of God. To have that Mary of Bethany heart, that John the Apostle heart that leans on the Lord's breast as an end in itself. It always bears fruit. It never stops there. Whenever we abandon ourselves to God, it always ends up impacting people. There is no way that you can do that without it impacting people. I was talking with some young people some time ago. And they, some of them were worried about the fact that if somebody, you know, is too much devoted to the Lord and spends too much meditate on the Word, if they do the first commandment, they'll kind of come up short on the second commandment. I said, that is a hypothetical theory that will never, ever be walked out. You can't do the first commandment and run into God. God is the author of the second commandment. It is an absolute, theoretical, I mean, hypothetical impossibility. It's just, it's just vain... Uh, a theory that you can do the first commandment without doing the second. You can even try to do the first one without the second one, but you break down and show compassion to people without trying. You can't run into God without melting in love towards people. You just can't do it. You can't grab hold of a fire and not have the marks of the fire on you. And so if you know somebody you're a little worried about, they're getting too devotional just give them a couple years and they'll come out of that on fire and they'll cause the fire to touch everybody around them. It's impossible to touch God as fire and not bring the fire to others. You'll, you'll melt down in His presence. Even if you're trying not to touch people, you'll end up doing it accidentally. And you'll do it in power. You can't run into the God who created the human heart without entering into compassion for it. Even if, it, even if it's not a goal, you will. So I, I kind of, I didn't want to be demeaning or anything, but I kind of chuckled and said, don't worry, that, that worry is, you're wasting energy. Nobody will be so devotional that they don't have compassion. It may take them a couple of years to connect, two or three years out of their 50 years of walking with the Lord, but in the end, they'll have a lot more fire when they touch people at the end of the day. I said, just let the Lord guide them, just leave them to the Lord. They'll, they'll be, you'll be surprised at the fire they'll come back with and how much... They'll impact people. But David's life vision, I totally believe this, was to be an abandoned worshiper. I will worship the Lord. In Psalm 145, which we're not going to by any means try to, to cover tonight, I just want to advertise it to you. I just want to give you a few ideas and kind of push you out on it. Because this is a psalm that I would challenge you, encourage you to get some commentaries. 
uh, to some, some people that have studied this psalm uh, for years and they've written on it and spent some real time. I, I, I've called Psalm 145 the Isaiah 40 of the book of Psalms. Isaiah 40 is just line upon line, undiluted glory of God. I mean, it's Isaiah 40 is wow. Psalm 145 is the Isaiah 40 of the book of Psalms. It's, it's way bigger than a course. These are the tracks that David ran on. I gave you, I gave you four tracks David ran on in, in Psalm 36. They talk about God's mercy and His faithfulness and His justice and His righteousness. These, this is a, a bigger picture, a bigger map. This is the theology of David summed up in one psalm. It's the praise of David, the psalm of David. And he's, Anyway, it's the name of God. David was focused. He emphasized, two times it's mentioned here, the, na- the discovery of the knowledge of God was the absolute issue before his mind because he knew the discovery of what God looked like would cause him to discover what he looked like to God and the power of those two truths would start a fire in him that nobody could put out. He knew that if he discovered what God looked like, the name of God, he would eventually know what he looked like to God. The power of those two truths, what God looks like and what we look like to God, those two truths will start a fire in you nobody will ever be able to put out. He knew that. He says, I'm going to interact with the name of the Lord. He says, I'm going to do it forever. I like it. He says, every day and forever and ever. And the forever and ever emphasizes the eternal dimension. And you say, well, oh, that's neat. No, David had a revelation that he was an eternal being that would forever be lost in the fascination and pleasure of worship. David knew this was his occupation forever. He knew it by revelation. This wasn't a cute little statement he did as an add-on. David, by revelation, said, I am an eternal being. I will live forever and forever and forever. And I will be forever lost in the fascination and in the pleasure of the fresh discoveries of the beauty of God. Because that's the essence of what I am as a being, as a living being. So David's defining his life when he says this. He knows that his life reaches beyond the earth. That's not an add-on. That's a statement of revelation. That's a statement of his identity. He says, I'm on the earth. He said in Psalm 39, we never had a chance to look at it. He said, my life on the earth, he says, is but a mere breath. He says, I'm a vapor on the earth. And he actually prayed in Psalm 39. He goes, Lord, let me know the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am, how quickly I enter into life and leave natural life. Let me know that I'm an eternal being of which 70 years on the earth is merely the womb of life. It's the period of gestation. You're only being formed on the earth with voluntary choices for that which you've been created to do forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. And And that's what David's saying here. He goes, my life reaches past the grave. He goes, I'm king of Israel. That's nice. I'm glad to be king of Israel. But that's not really what I'm about. I will praise you forever. I know who I am. I know I've been given capacities to discover you to proclaim who you are and to be consumed with you. And I know that's what I'll do forever, and I want to do it now. It's important that we try to find out what our earthly callings are. But did you know what? Something far more important is your eternal calling. You have an eternal calling. There are things you will do forever for millions and billions of years of which your time on the earth is all part of that. This is, this is real, and that's what David was saying. David's writing towards the end. He goes, every day I will bless you. That phrase, every day, is very significant. The every day of blessing God. Because in the every day, there's the smallness. You know, we get overwhelmed when we think about the vastness of worshiping God and entering into a a new reality. You know, the idea that we will be fascinated forever with God, that We'll have fresh discoveries. We will adore Him forever. And that the name of God is the fuel that sets our hearts on fire. The the revelation of God's name. That's wonderful. We believe that. We all say yes to that. But there's the everydayness now. What do you do tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock? The small steps. You know, it's the old phrase that we learned as a, you know, in our childhood, inch by inch it's a cinch, mile by mile it's a trial. 
Maybe that's new to you. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. Mile by mile, it's a trial. The point being, you grow in your capacities to worship by having mundane devotional times tomorrow for 30 minutes. Every day. He says, I don't praise you once I enter into some state of spiritual ecstasy and some newfound maturity that suddenly emerges. He goes, every day, tomorrow I do it. There's the smallness. There's the little time frames that are important. There's the baby steps. Every day means the little baby steps. Today, what do I do today? Well, you enter into the posture of waiting upon the Lord today. I love how Isaiah 40, one of my favorite chapters in the book of Isaiah, where the glory and the beauty of the Lord is laid out line by line by line, and you're a bit overwhelmed at the end of it. And then it says Isaiah speaks pastorally to young people, and he says, the young men stumble badly and they fail. He singles out young men as the group most perilous to fall in a most grievous way. He says, here's what I say to the young men that stumble, and I mean fall headlong. Simply just wait on the Lord. Just wait on the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 31, wait on the Lord and you'll mount up with wings as eagles is a pastoral encouragement to the exhortation to understand the transcendent majesty of God's beauty. And you say, it's too big. And then Isaiah said, well, just wait. Just Wait means two things. It means posture yourself devotionally with the Word, and it means don't get in a hurry. Lock yourself into a 5, 10, 15, 20-year time cycle. Wait. Be patient. Do it day by day. Just wait. Have endurance in the, in, in the journey. It's a long marathon race. Get into an endurance pace. Have patience in the race is what it's saying. Wait on the Lord. And it means wait on the Lord. Posture yourself devotionally with the Word of God and just begin to read the Word in the presence of God and pray. So what do you do? Isaiah 40. Oh, great forerunners, Isaiah 40. Calls the forerunners to feed on the majesty of God and preach it. Great message. What do you do? I'm stumbling badly. Well, good. You're the type of guy God calls, calls to be a forerunner. Get into a long-term pattern. Get into a patient cycle of just inch by inch. Today, praise the Lord. Get into a patience mode. And then get into a devotional posture and just do it every day. One of the passages that were so helpful to me in my early years in the Lord was a, a parable in Mark 4. I just absolutely loved it and I've preached it for 20 years. It's the parable of the kingdom where the farmer went out and sowed the seed. And when he got up in the morning, it says the seed grew. He was sleeping all night. And how it grew, he didn't know. He didn't have a clue when it grew. He just said, my goodness, it grew. And that's how our spiritual life is. While you're sleeping, that doesn't necessarily mean while you're at bed at night. It means while you're unaware. When you're not measuring, when you're not calculating, when you're not even discerning increase. While you're sleeping, you're not measuring it, you're not calculating it. You can't even discern it. While you're asleep, it grows. A couple years go by, you turn around and go, oh my goodness, the things that I hated, I'm beginning to be melted towards. When did that happen? Did it happen last January? I don't know when it happened. When I grew, I did not know. You can't discern it when it's happening. You can't measure it. You can't calculate it. It grows while you're sleeping. God designed it that way. So you can't measure it. He doesn't want you preoccupied with measuring it. He wants you to be lost in Him. Wait on the Lord. You know, I just did a conference recently. The Friends of the Bridegroom, the call of the forerunners. Yay! And now what do we do? It's a great conference. Bought all the books. You, wait, you do Isaiah 40, the call of the forerunners. They're called and they're given the mandate to feed on the majesty of God. That's their diet. Wow, too big. Now what? Well, the truth is I'm really stumbling badly. I'm a young man and I'm stumbling badly. Maybe you're a young woman, maybe you're an old man, it doesn't matter. The answer is, wait on the Lord. Just wait. That's what David says here every day. He goes, I know my eternal calling. I know who I am. I know I have a capacity to grow and to be forever fascinated with fresh discoveries of God. I know I've been given that privilege at the throne of God as a saint, and I know I have the capacity as a redeemed human being. But what am I going to do now? He says, every day. 
The every day doesn't just mean inch by inch. Every day means the good seasons and the bad seasons. And believe it or not, it's more difficult to praise God in the good seasons than the bad seasons. We think it's it's kind of, you know, when it's just kind of mundane sometimes is when it's the easiest. But when it gets good, when there's a whole lot going on, I've seen a lot of people, when they touch that little vein of economic prosperity, just that little vein of God's uh, promotion in ministry, they get lost in their prosperity and their economic or their new anointing or their new little conference ministry or their few people want them, and they completely lose their life in God. A couple of years go by, and like in blessing, they couldn't praise Him. They couldn't connect with Him in blessing. They had so many opportunities, they couldn't bear to miss one. So they were just in a frenzy all the time, and they disconnected with God because they had a little promotion. The promotion created a frenzy in them. Well, on the other end, there's pain. But sometimes the pain drives us because when we have pain, we have to get relief from pain, and we can find it in the presence of God. But David said whether it's good or bad, the north winds or the south winds, it's every day. The easy and the hard seasons, the baby steps, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the name of God. I'm going to focus on it. It's my eternal occupation. It's something I'm going to do on the earth my whole life. The Lord wants some of you to settle it. And I, and I know some of you already have, many of you. You are called in time and eternity to be extravagant worshipers of God. That's why you have life and breath in this age. And that's why you have an eternal spirit in the age to come. I mean, you have an eternal spirit now, but that's why you'll live forever is that you have a capacity by God's design to be fascinated with God forever. And that will be your pleasure and reward in both ages, your primary one. That's what David's stating here. Verse 3, he really kicks it into a new gear. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Well, great praise for the great God. There's two major themes he introduces right here. He's giving a context for his life vision in verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 and 2, it's his life vision. I'm going to get lost in the discoveries of the names of God, in the name of God, his unfolding of his beauty, and I'm going to be a worshiper. It's verse 1 and 2. That's his personal life vision. Now, verse 3, he begins to give some implications. Great praise for the great God. Well, which one do you want to do first? The great God or the great praise? Because the two go together. I told the Lord once, Lord, I want to be a man who knows what it means at the end of my life to have praised you greatly throughout my days. I don't mean in one kind of fervent moment at the very end. That's not what I mean. I mean I want to finish my life. When it's done, I want you to say he was a man that praised Jesus greatly. He was a great worshiper all of his days. And I know that when you're a great worshiper all of your days, like David, you're going to have some seasons of difficulty and struggle, so don't write yourself off. Instead of, great is the Lord, greater to be praised, put the phrase in, great is the Lord, He wants to be extravagantly worshipped. He wants to be greatly praised. He wants to be extravagantly praised or extravagantly worshipped. And then put your name, I will be one that extravagantly worship Him. Well, you know, I've said it like a broken record, great praise comes from great revelation. When you can't praise God in a great way in depth by just singing songs all the time. It's not about going to more meetings, although that's certainly a part of it. You go to meetings to worship God, you put it on the tape. It's about filling your mind with what God looks like. That's what awakens praise in a great way, in a mature way. To be a great worshiper, there has to be great revelation. And to be a great, have great revelation, there has to be some time in the presence of God. You can't get revelation without waiting in the presence of the Lord. You can't praise Him great without, re without great revelation. You can't do it. What does great revelation mean? I don't know. I'm just talking about revelation beyond the ordinary. And God will give it to whoever wants it. Say, oh Lord, I want to be great in revelation. I want to have my heart impacted with in a great way. I want to have a greatly impacted heart. That's what I mean by great in Revelation. So you want to greatly praise the Lord. Well, it's going to take revelation of the name of God. You're going to have to search the revelation that God has given His servants through history. That's called books. You have to search the Scripture. 
In verse 4, it talks about one generation shall praise your works to another. Shall declare your mighty acts. And we'll look at that in a minute. But there's a continuity, David understood, that one generation searches and they take what God has given them and they hand it to the next generation and we take advantage of it and there's an accumulation there's a building that's going on God had planned from the beginning I'm getting ahead of myself but God had planned that revelation would increase as history unfolded and the last generation would be the generation that used the discoveries of past generation that's called reading books there's never been more books available than this day just by simple math that's how it works there's more men and women that have written about God that's accumulated. It's growing, it's growing. There's more revelation about God written in the Holy Word of God, the Scriptures, and in the books, the record of anointed men and women. They're everywhere. And yet the church is too busy. The church is too busy doing other stuff, just staying busy. Entertainment, recreation, and just lots of activity. There's lots of talking and lots of busyness. And yet we have more revelation in 1998 than any other time in history. It's all recorded in the books. One of the great mercies of God. It's just everywhere. And yet God's servants are just too busy. Too busy to do it. I know the pressures of life are such. So just the economic pressures of making life work are very difficult. But I know it takes time. God's going to be greatly praised. That means He's going to have men and women that sit before Him and they grow in revelation. I'm going to, I want to be a great worshiper. An extravagant worshiper is another way of saying it. God's going to be greatly praised in many ways. The numbers will be great. On the last day, there will be billions. Oh, He will be greatly praised. I can imagine David saying, Hey, I told you guys He would be greatly praised. I mean, it will be awesome. The numbers in history. The skill, the orchestra, the choir, the skilled singing, the skilled musicians, the harps. He will be greatly praised. I mean, it will be awesome. David says, He will be greatly praised. The enthusiasm, it will be continual, it will be loud, it will be unified across the whole body of Christ. The occasion will be great. The coronation of Jesus as King. The wedding day. His rule over all of creation. There will be great seasons, great festivities. He will be greatly praised. There's many different ways of which He, the great God, will be greatly praised. But the way we care most about in this hour is that we sit before the Lord and we get a measure of revelation so we can extravagantly worship. Because again, worship does... Some people have the idea, I will go to more meetings and the more I worship, the more I will flow in worship. That, there's, some, there's some wisdom in that, but that's not exactly true. Fill your heart with understanding of the name of God. That's the wood that causes the fire to burn. Fuel yourself with revelation, not just songs singing to God. Put understanding. Word, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is ignited by the Logos, the Word of God entering the heart. He says in verse 3 that he's, he will be greatly praised. I want to be a great praiser. I want to be an extravagant worshiper. You want to be one. Make it your life vision. That's what David's saying. But he says, not only is his praise going to be great, he'll be greatly praised. He is the great as the Lord. And I love this. His greatness is unsearchable. It's unsearchable. There's where the element of mystery comes in. It's an eternal mystery. It's an eternal mystery. Unsearchable. Oh, what a phrase. What a word. Searchable. Unsearchable and searchable. What David means is, doesn't mean that he doesn't mean which some theologians through church history have concluded God is is uh, uh, incomprehensible so why try he doesn't mean that we can't ever gain revelation it means that we'll never exhaust his revelation of who he is he's inexhaustible he's unsearchable in his fullness is the point the I, I love to call it the vast ocean of the being of God and in the natural, the illustration I, that, that I enjoy the most is take one person, and if all the waters of the earth, the Pacific Ocean was fresh water, instead of salt water, instead of bitter water, what, how much could one person consume drinking as much as they could take all the days of their life? How much of the Pacific Ocean, let alone all the oceans of the earth, how much 
would be diminished. Of course, it would be undetectable. Because our capacity as one human being before the vast oceans of the earth is irrelevant. Well, the oceans are finite. God's infinite. Ten billion years times ten billion years, that vast ocean of His unsearchable greatness will not be diminished. David says it's unsearchable. The seraphim are the witnesses. Forever, it seems like. Although they are created beings, they have said holy, transcendent majesty, and they're overwhelmed. Yet, ten billionth time later, they're overwhelmed, and they're closing their eyes, overwhelmed and, and completely short-circuited yet again. Wherever we are in the eternal city, we'll look up and see those seraphim. There we are a billion years from now. They're going down again, overwhelmed, putting the wings over their eyes, overwhelmed at new discoveries of God. And we'll say, my, they have never exhausted new discoveries yet. And the Lord says, I'm unsearchable. I'm a vast ocean. No created being will ever contain my infinite greatness. David really tapped into this. It's not, I mean, David had an unusual measure of revelation, but of, of all of God, he never even entered into the beginning of the beginning of the first percent. But David understood the vastness. David had a unique understanding. Psalm 19, Psalm 29, Psalm 104. He saw the the beauty of God in the stars and the sun, and he had an unusual understanding of the vastness of God. And yet the God that created those stars, he, he spoke them into being and created that they were nothing to him to make. That's the God who is unsearchable. He's vast. The lifelong treasure hunt into the beauty of God. When I mean lifelong, I mean earth and eternal. Lifelong. Into eternal fascination with our Redeemer. The man Christ Jesus, the uncreated God, who spoke in Genesis 1 and brought out of nothing the created order. He wrapped Himself in the garments of man. He is absolutely delighted with you. And His his beauty has eternal fascination to it, as does the Father and the Spirit. The treasure hunt. David said, I want to tell you on the front end, it's unsearchable. He goes, I know from God. He did not lie. It's inexhaustible. Never. He goes, you, your little human frame will get so overwhelmed in this age. And when you, it's all said and done, you're only the beginning of the beginning of the first percent. He says it will thrill you, it will fascinate you, but you'll never exhaust it. Never, never, never will the pleasure and the fascination ever wear out. Ever, never. I like this word searching. Psalm 139 we looked at, verse 1 and verse 23. We looked at just recently. David said, search me, God. God searches David. And now here David is searching God. The search. The search for the unsearchable. Therein is, is the heart of that holy romance to discover the mystery of beauty, the fascinating mystery of beauty. The fascinating, the fascinating beauty, the mystery of beauty. That's where the heart of holy romance is all about the word search. Searching, searching, ever discovering. And in those new discoveries, concluding there's yet more that we do not know. You know, they say that you have to be a Ph.D. in math to really grasp how much math you do not know. Only the, the people that are deep in it, that are, you know, the, the aerospace Ph.D. guys and gals, it's those kind of people who understand that they don't understand math. You know, the ninth grader that made A in geometry is kind of said, well, I kind of grasp this stuff. They have no idea the l limitless possibilities that math presents. You have to get way out in it to understand you're only at the very beginning of it. Such is the being of God. In the search comes the, the, the discovery that the search is endless. We're surrounded by inexhaustible wonders. We really are. We truly are. By fascinating mysteries by unknowable beauties we're surrounded by them in God unknowable beauties the things we'll never ever fully know in this age or we'll never fully know them in the age to come but we'll be completely delighted at every step of the way the contemplative heart is 
most aware of the vastness of what they don't know. The bored and the stale believer, the majority of Christendom, are kind of like, well, I, you know, I've got a handle on the, you know, the introductory stuff. And the contemplative heart says, oh, no, no, you're not even at the beginning of the first percent. You don't know. The heart of Mary is more aware of how much is beyond her capacity, the Mary of Bethany. They're more aware of the riches of the unsearchable. riches. Paul the Apostle said that in Ephesians 3.8 when he talked about Jesus. He said the unsearchable riches of Jesus. Now here's this mighty Apostle who's been up to the third heaven. He came back and he said, let me tell you about this man Jesus. Unsearchable as well. Unsearchable. Well, Paul, it's a big word. He goes, oh, I've been there. He goes, you have no idea who he is. You have no idea. Unsearchable. But didn't you go to heaven? Don't you have the mighty spirit of revelation? You wrote half the New Testament? Yeah, I am more convinced than ever. Absolutely unsearchable. Billions of years we will be fascinated by who He is. The inexhaustible wonders of who He is is around us in everything He created. We can't see it though. Our eyes have not the capacity to see the inexhaustible wonders. The unknowable beauties of who He is. The fascinating mysteries of the being of God, the name of God. 10,000 times, 10,000 times, we'll be overwhelmed. Our capacity will be absolutely overwhelmed. Well, it's the heart of romance to search, isn't that? If you think about it, that's really what romance is about, the search. The search for the mystery of beauty. The search goes on. Well, the, the heart of the worshiper searches is the searching heart. Searching for the unsearchable. Now we can, it's a play on words, we can discover to our capacity right now and be, we can ache with pain at the little slivers of truth that we receive. The pain of them so expand us. You know, it's like breaking a 10-day water fast on a 32-ounce steak. It just really, really causes a lot of trouble. I read that in a book. It really will hurt you. Our little human frames get so stretched in pain with new discoveries. It's, we're so overwhelmed at such little fragments. The Lord says, I have so, so, so much if you went on the search with me, for me. Matter of fact, I believe the definition of wisdom, when it's all said and done, is throwing your life into searching for the unsearchable. That's really what wisdom is. If you do that, you're wise at the end of the day. And if you don't do that, you're not wise no matter how many books you write. If you throw your life into the search for the unsearchable richness, the unsearchable greatness, David called it the unsearchable greatness, Paul called it the unsearchable richness. If you throw your life into the searching for the unsearchable, you're called wise by God at the end of the day. If you throw your life into it, you're called a worshiper. You greatly praise Him. If you throw your life into it, you... That's the definition of pleasure. In reality, that's what pleasure is. That's what pleasure is at its most sublime, intense way, searching for the unsearchable with a life, with a full, loving, with a, a wholehearted diligence. That is the definition of pleasure in the truest sense of the world. Well, you will run into a fire that will get on people no matter if you don't want it to. If you try to go get lost in a cave somewhere, the fire will burn and you'll start a nation on fire accidentally. You don't even have to have it as your goal. You will. Oh, I love it. David says he's great. He says his greatness is unsearchable. Every attribute of God is great. Every attribute of God is infinite. Every single one of them. Now, the attributes of God create a problem for us. Because there's two types of attributes in the most basic way of talking about. There are the known attributes, the revealed ones, and there's the unknown attributes, the hidden ones. You know, God has attributes that we can't comprehend. Right? So we have the known attributes, the unknown attributes, the revealed ones and the hidden ones. Of the known attributes, our frame, our capacity can only take this, the, 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 the uh, weakest hints of the known ones. The weakest hints is the only thing we have capacity to take of the known ones. The unknown ones we can't even begin to comprehend. Teach the first grader calculus. The unknown ones, the Lord says, the ones I've told you, I've only given you the weakest, briefest introduction, and you're absolutely 
blown away. He goes, and the unrevealed ones, let's not go there right now. You don't even know. I'll give you a hint. Making the sun and ten billion suns greater than the sun was easy. Because I have things that you don't know anything about. Making suns, ten billion suns greater than our sun. And there are ten billion suns greater than our sun. The Lord said, that was easy. I didn't even have to stand. All I had to do was speak to do that. That was easy. I have things you don't know nothing about. I remember going into geometry class, ninth grade. The guy gets up and says, Pi. Now, what's pi? I remember we, had, we all had to study it. You know, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter. We all had to memorize that definition. Who remembers what pi? 3.14. 1.5. 9.256. 8 decimal points. I had a crush on my ninth grade teacher. Anyway, you go to a little first grader and say, pi. Take apple. No. The ratio of the circumference to the diameter. What? I'll take apple. They, have, they don't even know what you're talking about. God has attributes that we have no comprehension. But David said, by faith, he says, He's great as the Lord. He's greatly to be praised. He will be greatly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. He goes, It's the first grader trying to grapple with geometry or calculus. There's, there's no way. But beloved, if any, this course does anything to you, I trust that you will be thrust on the search, the wholehearted search for the unsearchable. If you do that, you end up wise when you die and stand before God. If you don't do that, I don't even care how many people you touch, you end up lacking wisdom on the last day. If you do it, that's the definition of worship, that's the definition of pleasure, that's the definition of impact, that's the definition of success. That's the definition of reward. That's the definition of everything. Jesus said in John 17, 3, He says, To know Me, to know My Father, is eternal life. The very essence of what eternal life is, is the eternal unfolding of new discoveries. And the fascination and the impact on your spirit of those new discoveries. That is the essence of eternal life. John 17, 3. He goes, Forever and forever and forever there will be new discoveries. And when those new discoveries hit your being, they will cause an emotional chemistry change in time and eternity. You will think and act different, and that's the essence of eternal life, interacting with new discoveries of me forever, 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 forever. And David said, I will worship you forever. Let's do it now. He knew he was a being made most with capacity and privilege to worship, to search the unsearchable. God is great, greatly to be praised. The length, eternally He's great. The length of time. The depth. Oh, the passion of His heart is great. The depth of His passion is love. The width and the breadth, the wisdom, the knowledge of God, the width and breadth of wisdom the Scripture talks about. Oh, it's so wide His understanding, His knowledge. The height, the power. He sits on high. He has total authority over everything. The length and breadth and height and width. He's great in everything. It's eternal. It's transcendent in power, transcendent in knowledge, transcendent in passion. Length and width and height and depth. Great is the Lord, David said. He's, he's at the end of his life. He's writing Psalm 145. He says, believe me, this is what life is about. Verse 4. The continuity of generations. One generation shall praise the Lord to another. David recognized the inherent responsibility of one generation to take what the other generations gave them and then to have fresh discoveries to give to the new generation. That's the inherited every that's the spiritual responsibility of every generation. David understood this. Each generation contributes its measure. But beloved, here's the exciting part. I already mentioned it, but it crescendos at the end. As history unfolds, the measure that God has given to the human race gets bigger and bigger and bigger. There is more revelation of God, which means Greater worship, greatly to be praised, great praise will be at the end of natural history compared to other time in history. God planned it that way. It's building. It's building. I have this idea that some of you 
in this room are going to give yourself to it. You're going to search the unsearchable, and you're going to say, I'm going to go find out what the fathers. It's not fair to call it the fathers. They call it the church fathers, but some pretty powerful mothers that are part of the fathers. But the saints, they've handed us a glowing baton of understanding. But, beloved, what they got in the 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 centuries, the Lord says, that isn't the measure of what I want to give the human race. That's only to get you jump-started. The great master at math teaches you to get you going quicker at a, at a greater measure. We're to take what they have and launch into regions beyond that God has already ordained to give the end-time church. Searching. Crescendoing at the end in Revelation. Because when you crescendo in Revelation, the church crescendos in worship. That's what it's all about, right? That's what this title in the Spirit, Friends of the Bridegroom, is all about. It's men and women, fasted lifestyles, lost in the discovery of the beauty of the Bridegroom. He's a Bridegroom, King, and Judge. We have the privilege to learn from the past, to take everything they'll give us. Some of the great shining lights of history. Let's take what they can give us. But let's, let's not end there. Let's have pleasure of new discoveries in the present. And let's give the young generation this thing. From my point of view, it's all about the group 20 years and younger. I just I will always say 20 years and younger. I'll say that for 30 more years. So that's not a technical prophetic phrase, but it's always about the group 20 and under. It really is. The Lord wants to see some fathers and mothers in this spirit. Some of you are 25 and some of you are 65. To find some things out about God and make it clear to the next generation so that at 20 they can begin running where we left off. For real. This is real. But here's the, here's the problem. The fathers of this generation are just consumed in their own ministries. God wants them lost in searching the unsearchable so they can give something to the next generation. God doesn't want us to give them paid for buildings and big mailing lists. That's not what He was talking about. He wants us to give fresh discoveries, not, not organizations that are kind of really built strong. It's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But that's not what this is talking about in verse 4. There's a storehouse. And God wants to fill, open the treasure house and fill our storehouse of Revelation. Oh, look at verse 5. This is, again, we're not going to get very far in this. I just, I just want to tell you Psalm 145 is a big one. David says it. He just says it just straight out in verse 5. He says two things. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonder-producing works. I had wonder-producing. Wondrous means I, I meditate on the things that you've done that produce wonderment in my heart. Fascination is another word. Marvel is another word. David says, I'm going to meditate on two things. I'm going to meditate on the splendor of your majesty. The word splendor is the same word used often. as the word beauty. It's literally translated. You know the word... Uh, and the beauty of holiness, in Psalm 110, verse 3, that's the same word, Hadar. It's the word translated beauty many times in the Old Testament, Hadar. It could be translated beauty, splendor. It could be translated excellence or magnificence, the Hadar of God, the Hadar of His majesty. It could be beauty, it could be splendor, it could be magnificence. It could be the excellence of your majesty. I like the word beauty. I like the word beauty because that's the word David used back in Psalm 27, 4. He says, I will, this one thing, your beauty, your Hadar, the Hadar of God, your excellence. Again, it's translated beauty of holiness in Psalm 110, verse 3. David said, here's what I want to do. I'm going to spend my focus in on two things. The glorious beauty of your majesty and upon your wonder producing, your wonderment, your marvel-producing works. I'm going to meditate on what you've done and let it trace, lead me back to who you are. That's, that's, that, that, that's the logic of the passage. David says, I'm going to study what you've done, and when I study what you've done, it's going to lead me logically to what you're like in your heart. There's three vast arenas of God's works that David outlines all through the book of Psalms. Obviously, creation and Beloved, we haven't hardly begun to understand the beauty of the Lord in creation. The beauty of the Lord in creation. That was one of David's favorite themes. He could see the beauty of the Lord. He had the spirit of revelation on him. He could see creation. 
And it led him to worshiping the beauty of God. Creation is one thing. But creation is not just in time. Creation is time and eternity. Matter of fact, all three of these are time and eternity. I mean, think about the eternal city. That's creation. The eternal city, Revelation 21. Oh, my goodness. Creation is, 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 is the first arena of God's works. Next arena is God's administration of history. What He allows. And the reason He allows what He allows. And what He stops, what He doesn't allow. And the reason He doesn't allow what He doesn't allow. It's His administration of history. See, when you have total power, the way you administrate history is a real revelation about your values. The administration of history is one of the great themes of David in the book of Psalms. The way God unfolds history. There's so... The way He unfolds history in eternity, not just in time. There's so much about what God's like in the, in the meditation of the beauty of God in the unfolding of history. And of course, the third one, the most dramatic of all, is redemption. His redemption. Those three themes... If we spent 10 hours a day for 100 lifetimes, we'd only get 1% of what God contains, even in just creation, history, and redemption in this age, not, not even mentioning those three things in the age to come. But when John was given the book of Revelation, Revelation 1.1, here's what it says. That God the Father, this is really an am amazing uh, little statement. The Revelation 1.1 has about... Five or six movements in it. Revelation 1 1 calls the whole 22 chapter book the revelation of Jesus. The book is the unveiling of the beauty of Jesus. The book of Revelation is. All 22 chapters is, is just a document that unveils Jesus' beauty. It's the unveiling of Jesus' splendor, his Hadar. But here's what it says it says, The revelation which God gave Jesus. Why, well, it's Jesus' own beauty. The Father says, Your beauty is so powerful, it is so lots of things. Your beauty is so dear to me. Your beauty is so powerful on human history, it will completely shift the balance of human history when your beauty is unfolded. It's so strategic. It changes so many things. God says, I own your beauty, not even you. It says, The revelation which God gave to Jesus. Jesus has the right to unveil His beauty. He gives it to an angel. His angel. I want to meet Him. Her. This angel gives it to John. Then John gives it to the early church. And the early church puts it in the, in the canon of Scripture for us. It goes out about five or six steps. But it's all about... It starts with God the Father. And it says, here's what He's going to do. He says, I'm going to tell you the things He does. It's things. It's activities. When you meditate on the things Jesus does in the book of Revelation, and you meditate on it the right way, it leads you to the beauty of His heart. It's a bit of the romance. It's the mystery. It's the hiddenness part. God says, I'll give you some things, and they'll lead you to who I am. I'll just... I'll leave you with that document. Now just go pray and fast over it for a lifetime and you'll run right into the mountain of my unsearchable splendor. The book of Revelation is a really important book in the discovery of the beauty of the Lord. But the point of it is, David says, I'm going to search your works. Your works. I'm going to go on a treasure hunt for the beauty of God. I want to know what the Hadar of your majesty is like. I want to see what you've done. But I went by the Logos, the written Word, and the Holy Spirit. Show me what you're like in your heart, Father. Show me what your being is like in its radiance. The Father says, I'll give you some. David says, well, in that case, I'll meditate on it all my days. I'll spend my whole life meditating on the Hadar of Your Majesty, the beauty of Your Majesty, and I'll spend my days meditating on the wonder-producing activities that You've done in history, in creation itself, in the administration of history, and the accomplishment of redemption. David was king second. He was a worshiper first. And then we're, we're at the end here, verse 6 and 7. David says, When I meditate on the Hadar, the splendor, the beauty of your majesty, and upon your works, he says, here's what's going to happen. When I meditate, verse 6, people will speak. I'll meditate... 
and things will happen. He skips a few of the steps here, and then people are going to speak. He goes, well, I'll tell you, I'm going to declare it. What I meditate on, I'm going to declare. And in verse 7, he says, they will utter. And I love what it says in the margin, they will eagerly utter, or they will, like, bubble forth. It's the word of a gushing river. Some versions actually use the word river. In verse 7, I will... The people that I declare your greatness to, they will explode like a rushing river about your goodness and they will sing of the glories and the splendor of your righteousness. When David gazes on things, a fire gets in him. When he speaks it, he puts the fire in others and they speak and they sing and they spread the fire everywhere. That's David's life mission. That's a good life mission, isn't it? Then he starts in verse 8 and 9. He goes, I'll just begin. With your mercy. Oh, the kindness of God. So I'll just, I, I will give you the, just something to meditate on. Just to leave you with the skeletal thing here. And I'm going to pray over you. Verse 1 and 2 is David's life mission. Verse 1 and 2 is his life mission. He's going to gaze on a name and he's going to worship night and day. Because he knows his identity is an eternal worshiper. Verse 1 and 2. It's David's life vision. It's how he understands himself. Verse 3 is the great theme. The great focus of, his med- uh, of David's life. The unsearchable. The unsearchable greatness. He puts it all together. I want to greatly praise the great God. I want to be an extravagant worshiper of the God who's worthy of worship. Verse 4 and 5. He's going to meditate upon the beauty of God, just in his essence, and the beauty of God is seen in the, in the things he's done. Verse 4 and 5. He's going to meditate on God's beauty, the essence of it, who he is, and what he's done, because the two go together, two sides of one coin. Verse 4 and 5. Verse 6 and 7, it's David's public ministry. He's going to speak of the greatness. And when he speaks of it, he's going to set the fire loose into singers and in preachers. He's going to cause preachers and singers to absolutely explode like an, uh, a bubbling, exploding river. When he says, when I let go loose, what I have is going to set the river flowing in other people. Someone says, well, what, what, what are you, where, what's going to be the message? God's greatness in His mercy, verse 8 and 9. God's greatness is related to His mercy. Oh, there's so, every phrase there is so loaded. We're kind of used to those phrases, so they don't mean as much. They're loaded. The greatness of His kingdom, verse 10 to 13. The greatness of His kingdom. His eternal reign over angels, demons, humans. His, his, his authority, His kingdom. His great plan. You could call that His plan if you want to. The great blueprint, the kingdom. It's where it's all going. His greatness of provision, verse 14 and 16. He tenderly provides for every single living being, the little insect as well as the cherubim. Every single living being He provides tenderly for. Think of all the forms of life. Not one of them is an accident. Then finally, the greatness of His saving righteousness. His saving righteousness. It's not just that we're forgiven. Beloved, we're going to be in in that glittering, gleaming glory of righteousness is going to race through our own beings. It's not just that we're forgiven. We're going to be like Him. That's verse 17 to 21. That's David just gives the outline of what he lives meditating on. Every one of those is a volume. It's what caused David to be a worshiper. Amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.